whose sins you will forgive, they are forgiven them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. When G.K. Chesterton, the famous English convert, was asked what aspect of the Catholic faith made the most impression upon him, he immediately answered, confession. And he went on to explain, when I was a Protestant, he said, I felt I could go into my room or out into a field and tell God that I was sorry for my sins. And he said, I feel as if God had forgiven me. But now as a Catholic, he said, when I go into the confessional and tell my sins to the priest, and when the priest in God's name tells me I'm forgiven, I don't just feel I'm forgiven. I know I'm forgiven. And Chesterton concluded, that makes all the difference in the world. And of course, Chesterton was right, because Jesus tells us in the gospel, not just everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father. So we can ask, what is God's will for us then? St. James gives us the answer in his epistle, where he says, confess your sins to one another. That's why we confess our sins to the priest who is God's minister. Now, obviously, only God can forgive us the sins that we've offended him by. But God so desires to forgive us our sins that he has given to his own priests his own divine power to forgive sins, no matter what kind of sin, no matter how many times it's been committed. That's why St. Paul tells the Corinthians, for what, I have agreed, for what I have pardoned, he says, I have done it in the person of Christ. So when you go into the confessional and tell your sins to the priest, and when the priest gives you God's, the, the, the absolution, that's God's forgiveness for your sins, it is God, it is Jesus Christ who is forgiving you simply through the person of the priest. The priest is only God's instrument, whoever the priest may be, whether a saint or even a sinner himself. Now we can ask, why is it that even among Catholics, even among traditional Catholics, there are those souls who end up in hell? We can answer that if a Catholic ends up in hell, it's usually because after they've offended God by committing a deliberate mortal sin, they may have then gone on to compound the problem by making a deliberately bad confession. So you remember from your catechism that if you deliberately don't reveal a certain mortal sin in confession because you're too embarrassed to admit to it, that actually makes the sin, that, that makes the, the sacrament invalid and sacrilegious. Not because God doesn't want to forgive you, he does. It's like you're, you're placing obstacles to receiving his forgiveness, to receiving his mercy. Likewise, if you want to, if you're deliberately not loud enough to deceive the priest. Now, normally you get Father Burford around here, so he's too young. You know, he doesn't get bad hearing, so it's not. But sometimes it happens with an older priest. Someone goes in there and says, "Bless me, Father Fred," and Father, I commit a <laughs> that would also commit, commit make the sacrament invalid and sacrilegious. Even if you're deliberately not examining your conscience sufficiently, because. You're pretty sure there are some inconvenient mortal sins there that you don't want to have to remember because you don't want to have to confess them. That would also make the sacrament invalid and sacrilegious. Now, we all want to avoid ending up in hell. We all want to get to heaven. That's why you're here tonight. So in order to do this, you first of all, you need to know how to confess yourselves. That's what we're going to look at right now in two points. Firstly, how to make a good confession, and secondly, how you can easily make a general confession of your entire life. Good, let's start off with our first point, how to make a good confession. And the information in this point will be good for any confession you ever need to make in your entire life. So first of all, let's see what sins you've got to confess. You've got to confess every unconfessed mortal sin that you've committed since your baptism. Obviously, it's helpful if you can also confess the venial sins as well, obviously, but you've got to confess the mortal ones. What happens, though, when you have doubtful mortal sins? 
doubtful because you're not sure if you had the sufficient reflection or full consent of the will to make this in subjectively mortal. Now, strictly speaking, you don't have an obligation to confess these doubtful mortal sons, but it's really good if you do, because if you deliberately don't confess them because you're too embarrassed, you can be sure that as soon as you walk out of the confessional, you're going to have the devil sitting right there on your shoulder, whispering in your ear, you know that was mortal. You're going to burn in hell for that one. And so the only way to get rid of that devil off your shoulder is to eat humble pie and then confess those doubtful sins to the priest. Now, obviously, you tell the priest that they were doubtful mortal sins. But at least by having the humility to admit to those doubtful mortal sins, you're getting rid of that devil. And he won't be able to take away your piece of soul again. You remember from your catechism that there are three things necessary to make a sin mortal. Grave matter, sufficient reflection, and full consent of the will. Let's take a look at these three elements. Firstly, grave matter. This means it's got to be something that is seriously contrary to the law of God. Then, secondly, sufficient reflection. So this is on the part of the intellect. What we usually call our mind, the intellect says, I know I shouldn't be doing this. Now, please note, this is not a theological reflection. It's not saying, I know if I do this, I'm offending God, or I know if I do this, I'm, I'm uh, offending my, my, crucifying my loving Savior. No, this is actually simply on the level of natural ethics. I know I shouldn't be doing this. And that's why, yes, even atheists do offend God, even if they don't believe in him. And then the, after the act of the intellect comes the act of the will, what we usually call our heart. So after the intellect says, I know I shouldn't be doing this, the heart then says, but I'm going to do it anyway. And that is where mortal sin takes place. Now, it is possible also to give what's called partial consent of the will instead of full consent of the will. For example, a person who toys with a temptation before they actually set it aside, that would be partial consent of the will, and that would make the sin subjectively venial. And this is what Jesus means, but please note that sin takes place here in your heart, in your will, in your desires, even before anything happens externally in your actions or in your behaviors. And that's what Jesus means in the gospel, where he says, anyone who even looks with lust upon a woman has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, obviously, the externalization of a sin does make it a worse kind of mortal sin. But mortal sin takes place here. That's why even thoughts and desires fully consented to are mortal sins. Now, how do you confess mortal sins? There are three things that you may need to confess. Firstly, the species, we'll come back to explain this. Secondly, the number. And thirdly, certain circumstances. So let's look at these three elements. Firstly, you've got to confess what's called the species of the sin. In other words, what kind of sin was it? You can't just give a genus. You can't say, Father, I committed a sin against the fifth commandment. Well, that could be a lot of different things. So that's a genus. You want to come down to the specific difference. What kind of sin was it? Then, after you've named the species of the sin, you then want to number, give the number of times it's been committed. Now, this you do need to give a number for mortal sins. With venial sins, obviously, it's helpful if you can give a number, but it's not nearly so important. The idea is that with mortal sins, we want to tell Jesus that we're sorry for each and every time that we've offended him gravely. So, if you know the exact number of times you committed a mortal sin, you tell the priest the exact number. If you know that you've committed a mortal sin five times, you say five times. If you were to say, Father, I committed a mortal sin four or five times, no, it was exactly five, then you're playing with a sacrament. And while that may not actually invalidate it, it is dangerous. Whereas if you were to say, Father, I committed that mortal sin four times, knowing that it was five, and 
you're not willing to tell Jesus that you're sorry for having offended him that fifth time. It means that you've actually just made a sacrilegious confession and none of your sins are forgiven, not because God doesn't want to forgive you, but because you're placing obstacles to receiving his mercy, to receiving his forgiveness. That's why we need to break down the obstacles to receiving God's mercy and forgiveness, by, especially by making a good confession of our sins. But what happens when you really don't know the exact number of times you've committed a mortal sin? This is especially the case with sins of thought. I mean, how are you supposed to give an exact number to them? Or again, when you're making a general confession of your entire life, how are you supposed to give an exact number? In these cases, an approximation is sufficient where the real, known is un real number is unknown, or perhaps even unknowable. In these cases, it's good if you tell the priest how long you were addicted to the sin and how frequent it you would normally occur during that time frame. So for, to give you an example, you might say, Father, I committed such and such a moral sin about twice a week for about five years. That way, the priest has a good approximate number. And even if the real number is higher or lower, God sees that you're doing your best to make a good confession, and ultimately, that's all that God's interested in. And that's why you don't have to give an exact number where the exact number is unknown. So for example, you don't say, Father, I committed that mortal sin 14,567 times, and maybe two thirds, maybe three quarters. Yeah, don't even try, okay? Because the priest is gonna, the priest is going to be thinking, yeah, how do you know it wasn't 14,568? You yeah, don't even try. Now, also, there are certain sins that can be confessed as a continuous act because they last through time. This is especially the case with the sin of hatred, which can usually last for months, years, decades. And so here you simply confess it, Father, I hated my mother-in-law for 10 years. The priest gets the idea it was all that time. However, in any confession of your life where you are confessing mortal sins, please do not say something like this. Father, I don't know how many times I committed that mortal sin. Can you give me an approximate number? Father, I did it sometimes. How often is sometimes? Father, I did it lots of times. Would you please give me a number? Or best yet, Father, I did it a million times. <laughs> Does that one. <laughs> okay, so the priest gets the idea it was really frequent. But please have mercy on the priest, because the priest has to have some kind of approximate number just to be able to pass judgment on your confession. Now, besides the species and the number, that you sometimes you need to confess certain circumstances as well, but only circumstances that change the nature of the sin. Let me give a couple examples. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Father, I stole 200 bucks. Where did you steal it from? I stole it from the Catholic Church. Ah, now that's a circumstance that does need to be specified in confession. Because the Catholic Church belongs to God, therefore stealing from the Catholic Church is like stealing from God. Therefore, it's not just a sin of theft, it's actually a sin of sin of, sin of theft and sacrilege, two sins in one. That's why you do have to confess that circumstance. But let's give another example. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Father, I stole 200 bucks from a church. Which church did you steal it from? I stole it from the Baptist church down the street. You don't actually have to specify that because non-Catholic churches don't belong to God. They belong to you know who. <laughs> That's why stealing from them is not a sin of sacrilege. It's only a sin of theft. Let's give another example. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Father, I hated someone. Who did you hate? I hated my parents. Oh. Now that's a circumstance that does need to be specified in confession. Because it's one thing if you just hate someone. Let's say you're walking down the street and Joe Q. Public gives you this really nasty look and you think, I hate his guts. That's one thing. Whereas by the fourth commandment, we are positively obliged to love and reverence our parents. That's why hating our parents is so much worse than hating anyone else. But please note that only the circumstances that can change the nature of the sin are to be confessed. If it doesn't change the nature of the sin, do not confess it. Father, it happened in the springtime. Who cares? <laughs> <sighs> 
So now we all know how to go to convention, but it's good to be reminded once in a while. So first of all, you examine your conscience. If necessary, write, write your sins down so you don't forget them. And then you go into the confessional, kneel down and say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. My last confession was however many week, days, weeks, months, less, hope not years, that it's done. You then confess your sins loud enough to be heard by the priest, but not loud enough to be heard by everyone waiting outside. At the end of your confession, it's helpful if you add a little prayer, for these and all the sins of my past life, I am heartily sorry. Because that way the priest knows that you're finished with your confession and that you're not trying to think of something else that you need to confess. The priest will then give you some advice and he'll give you a sacramental penance that you do after your confession. You then see your act of contrition, again, loud enough to be heard by the priest, simply because the priest has to know that you're sorry for the sins that you've just confessed. And even if, I don't know if this applies to anyone here, but if English is not your first language, you can always see your act of contrition in whatever language you're most comfortable with. The priest doesn't actually have to understand the individual words, he simply has to know that you're saying your act of contrition. And while you're saying your act of contrition, the priest will be giving you the absolution that's God's forgiveness for your sins and then you do your penance afterwards, ideally as soon as possible, but the main thing is that you have the intention eventually to get your penance done. Now, the sacramental penance that the priest gives you in confession, that is restitution that you make to, you to God for your sins, and that's why the penance does bind in conscience. So, if you have confessed just venial sins, the penance itself will bind under pain of venial. But let's say that you've confessed bigger sins, mortal sins. Then the penance itself will also bind under pain of mortal sins. So that if you deliberately don't do the penance the priest has given you, you're committing another mortal sin on top of the other ones. So that's why you do want to mention in confession, if you've ever neglected to do the penance the priest has given you in confession. And then please specify whether you deliberately didn't do the penance, because that could mean that you've got bad confessions there you need to make up for. Or if you simply forgot to do the penance, or it was like some strange litany of humility and you couldn't find it. In which case, you know, God understands that, then, you, then the priest will give you something else to do for, instead for that penance. For your encouragement, remember that the priest is bound by what we call the seal of the confessional. If a priest were ever to say, so-and-so did such-and-such, which the priest knows only <coughs> through confession, the priest would actually be automatically excommunicated, and only the Pope himself could absolve that excommunication. But not even so, someone so bad in his private life as Martin Luther is believed to have been, it's believed that Luther was a womanizer and a drunkard and all like that, not even Martin Luther was ever accused of having broken the sacramental seal. That's because the Holy, gift, the Holy Ghost gives to his priests, even unworthy sinful priests like Luther, this special grace not to reveal what they've heard in the sacrament. Moreover, when you have a visiting priest like a missionary, he comes and goes unknown. And for some people, it's simply easier to be able to confess to a priest who doesn't recognize your voice. That's understandable. But, and so as a result, you, you can confess without shame. But even when you do go to your regular confessor, you never need to worry, what's Father going to think if I tell him that sin? Because while it is true the priest is a minister of God's justice, firstly, we're a minister of God's mercy. Oftentimes we priests, we get asked, don't you get depressed listening to all those sins? And I'd say it's actually the other way around. The more sins the priest hears, the more he is convinced of the infinite mercy of God to the repentant sinner. Because the priest, remember, he's your friend. He's not a monster. He's not going to be yelling at you, you did what? <laughs> you know, it's not like we actually wear a t-shirt under here that says, I eat sinners for breakfast. <laughs> While it's true that the priest must be a lion in the pulpit, you'll find that he's a lamb in the confessional. Now, sometimes it does happen that people are understandably embarrassed by the things that they have to confess. If this ever happens to you, start your confession telling the priest that. Just say, Father, I'm really ashamed of myself. Father, I'm really embarrassed by this. Father, this is a really hard confession for me to make. That way the priest knows to help you to make the confession more easy. Because confession never needs to feel like you're committing mari-kari.
And when we've got a parish mission, like we have this weekend, St. Alphonsus of Liguori says that a parish mission, it, like, a, like a retreat, is a time of what he calls the extraordinary mercy of God. And that's why small penances are given even for a lifetime of sin. St. Alphonsus de Liguori is the patron saint of confessors. And he used to tell his priests, give small penances, he said, because we want people to hate sin, not the penance. So normally the biggest penance that I give for a general confession of a lifetime of sin, normally all I give is five mysteries of the rosary. Usually I give the five sorrowful mysteries. Normally I give that to everyone straight across the board actually. It just makes it easy for everyone to remember actually. So that you know you've got your five sorrowful mysteries out of the way, you've got it behind you, you can move on with your life. Now here's one penance that you won't get from me. For your penance, you will say one rosary with the stations of the cross between every Hail Mary. <laughs> How can you be sure that you really are sorry for your sins and that you don't want to commit them again? Before you go into the confessional, just pray your act of contrition, say, say it in your, silently in your head, and think about the words. Because if you mean what you say, yes, you will make a good confession. That brings us to our second point, how you can easily make a general confession of your entire life. So a general confession, that means going back over your life, at least since your last general confession, we'll explain that in a moment, and reconfessing all those mortal sins. You can also mention habits of venial sin also, but it's mainly about the moral sins, in fact. Now, who needs to make a general confession? Okay, so you've got two extremes. On the one extreme, certain persons must make a general confession. At the other extreme, certain persons must not make a general confession. Most people fall between the two extremes. So let's explain this. On the one hand, some persons must make a general confession. This is a case of someone who has been making deliberately bad confessions. So there are five reasons why there can be bad confessions there. So firstly, if you have not confessed your mortal sins because you're too embarrassed about to mention them. Secondly, if you did not have a true sorrow for having offended God. Thirdly, if you did not have the firm purpose of amendment, you know, because you didn't have this resolution to change your life, you were just blasé, just like, oh, we all right, what's wrong with offending God, doesn't matter. You know, God's big marching on, you know, whatever. Then you, get, then you get the fourth reason, persons who are unwilling to make up for grave, um, grave sins of uh, injustice against their neighbor. So this is like a theft, a theft and destruction of property. We're talking big things, okay, big things. Um, and then finally, the fifth reason is someone who is unwilling or has been in the past even unwilling to give up the, what we call the unnecessary proximate occasions of mortal sin. So these persons of the, in these five classes, they are living in the state of sin. So they are not in God's grace, they're in a state of God's disgrace. And so the only way that these persons can return to God's grace and friendship is by going back over their life, at least from the point where they started making the bad confessions, and then reconfess all those sins. Because in such a way, a person can return to God's grace and friendship, which is what God wants, obviously. That's the one extreme. Now, at the opposite extreme, are those who must not make a general confession, okay? This is the case of someone who is scrupulous. So as I told you before, if you think that every little thing that you do is a mortal sin that's going to send you to hell, you are scrupulous. If you think that breathing is a mortal sin, if for you it is, yes, you are scrupulous. If a priest has told you you are scrupulous, yes, you are scrupulous. And so if you are scrupulous, then please do yourself and me a favor and do not even try to make a general confession during this parish mission, please. St. Alphonsus, who himself actually suffered from scruples at various times in his life, St. Alphonsus says that the scrupulous soul must not make a general confession because, he says, it can actually cause spiritual trauma. And so that's why he says, someone who is genuinely scrupulous, which is actually different from mere scrupulosity, which is another question I won't even touch, that on, touch on that right now. 
But someone who is genuinely scrupulous, he says, must simply be satisfied with making a normal confession during a parish mission. God's not asking anything more from you. Now, as I say, those are the two extremes, but most of you are going to fall in between the two extremes, of course. So it may not be necessary for you to go back over your life again, but you'll find it's really helpful. Because by going back over our life, reviewing it again, and telling Jesus how sorry we are for all those past sins again, then at the same time that you are purifying your soul, your soul again from those past stains, you're also opening up your heart to receive bigger graces from him in the future. But Father, you might say, you know, I've always done my best to make a good confession of my sins. You know, why should I have to reconfess all those mortal sins? Doesn't it almost seem like I'm denying God's forgiveness? And no, St. Thomas Aquinas explains this. He says that while your sins were forgiven, the first time you made a good confession of them, he says that while those sins were taken away from your soul, still, he says, especially in the case of a bad habit, is, he says it's like there are these, what he calls, roots of sin that sort of like get stuck in this all. And that's what causes us to be fall back into bad habits again and again. So St. Thomas says that when we make a general confession of those past sins, tell Jesus how sorry we are again for those past sins, he says it's like you're actually pulling out the very roots of those sins. And as a result, he says, it's much harder for the devil to tempt you back into those same old sins again. And it's much harder for you to fall back into the same sins also after a general confession. That's why, for most people, every few years, personally, I think optimally, about every five years is excellent for making a general confession. Before Vatican II, you had the Redemptorist Fathers and the Passionist Fathers who would go every three years and preach in every parish every three years. So you know, before the council, people, a lot of Catholics were used to making a general confession every few years, actually. Unfortunately, since Vatican II, you know, a lot of this has been, as, long, as well as a lot of other stuff, has simply been lost. And that includes parish missions, unfortunately. So it's good for us to actually get into the habit of making these general confessions every few years. Canon law actually says that a parish is supposed to have a parish mission at least once every 10 years, actually. But as I said, it was common about every three years, in fact. Now, how do you make a general confession? So, first of all, you examine your conscience. And it's for a general confession, it's, for the vast majority of people, it's best if you write down your sins. That way you don't forget what you need to confess. The idea is that you come prepared. What's, you know, what, what you don't want to be doing is just coming through there and coming in, you haven't even looked at the examination of conscience, and then you're, you're going through the examination of conscience while you're in the confessional. Let's see, now did I do that? Oh, Father, I'm not sure if I did that or not. No, you come prepared. That's the idea, that's important. Now, when you're examining your conscience, it's, it's helpful to go over your states of life because that's where most of our sins are actually committed. So, go over the time. When you were a child, when you were dating, when you were married, when you had kids, when you were widowed, etc. Then go over your specific states of life. So, gentlemen, whether you were a professional or worked in a trade, ladies, if you were a stay-at-home mom or if you had to work outside the house. Because, as we say, it's usually in these areas that most of our sins are committed. Um, the confession line. There is. We'll be having confessions. You know, in that room that's a what, about three doors down. What's it called? Ambassador. ambassador. Thank you. The ambassador room. And actually, about, so I think it's like three or four door, doors down here. And there is a seat um, you know, uh, for two people. I suppose we could sit there. Maybe we could get some more more seating out there. Oh. Okay. And sit in line. Oh, because it's good. It's, it's important to know who's next in line for, to go to confession, especially tomorrow afternoon when it'll keep on going. Hopefully, for we to continue. Now, especially tomorrow afternoon, then when I'm happy to hear confessions, you know, as late as necessary. Last night I was in. I finished the mission in Arcadia, and um, yeah, I got out of there at 
of the pretty action. It was good. You know, that's what I'm here for, actually. I don't mind this. I hope my driver doesn't mind it either. Anyway, that's another question. <laughs> so, um, so that's really, yeah, so I'm used to this. I mean, the uh, uh, St. Mary's, Kansas kept me up until 2.30 one morning in order to be sick at Post Falls because they kept me up to 1.30. Anyway, that's another story. Anyway, so I'm sure we won't have to do that here. <laughs> We're not that big, okay? But it just lets you know, I don't mind. You know, I'm, re I'm used to hearing confessions, you know, from, you know, single law, single law. And so, uh, but however, uh, when I do hear them for hours on end, I do take a five minute break every hour. So if you leave, see me leaving the confessional, I'm not running away, okay? <laughs> now there is obviously the light in the room, obviously, so that you can read what you've got there. Please make your normal confession first, because that way the priest knows what sins have never been confessed before. And please state your state of life, whether you are single, married, and, uh, engaged, uh, widowed, whatever. And also mention any mortal sins that you have neglected to confess. And please specify whether you deliberately did not confess them, which could mean that there are bad confessions there. Or if you simply just never thought about it, and in which case I wouldn't necessarily invalidate any confessions. Then after you've made your normal confession, you do not wait for the priest to give you a penance or any, any advice, etc. You go immediately into your general confession by saying something like, and now I'd like to make my first general confession or my last general confession was however many years ago it's been. Now, if this is just your second general confession, you're encouraged to go over your entire life a second time because you'll remember sins that you forgot in your first general confession. And also that second time of your entire life, you'll get a real hatred for sin and a real appreciation for God's goodness, his patience, his love, and his mercy. However, if this is your third or more general confession, you may simply want to go back to your last general confession, however many years ago it's been. Or you may want to hit some of the low points in your previous life. That's up to you how you want to do it. Uh, now, so we do have some children, I'll just mention. So normally children under the age of 13 don't need to make a general confession. They can also if they want. It's, it's, a, it's actually sort of cute. I don't think we've got any real little ones here, but I'll just mention. So it is sort of, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's actually quite cute when you get a seven-year-old coming in, you know, and say, Father, this is my first general confession. Father, I've been a brat my whole life. <laughs> And they do get a plenary indulgence by doing that, actually. <laughs> and finally, there are three rules for making a good general confession, and these are very easy rules to remember. There, we call them the three Bs. Be brief, be blunt, be gone. Let me explain. Be brief. Even if you are 80 years old and this is your first general confession and you have a San Diego telephone book full of sins, as long as you come prepared, you will be able to make your general confession within 15 minutes or less. That's 15 minutes, one, five, not five, zero. Moreover, those of you who have made at least one general confession before, you know how this works, and you've, you've done it before, it's easy, you know, and most people, you know, the second, third time, you can do it with them, certainly within 10 minutes, and if you've done several, you know, half a dozen general confessions in your life, you, within five minutes, honestly, it's that simple, honestly. So then secondly, be blunt. You are there to tell your sins, not your spouse's sins. You are there to accuse yourself, not excuse yourself, and please, 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 no stories, no stories, please. <laughs> so we priests, we love listening to the life stories of our faith, but not during a general confession. It takes way too long. Father, when I was four years old, my mother. No, no stories, okay? Yeah, I am inexorable about this. You start the story, I will stop. <laughs> so finally, be gone. So because there are going to be others waiting in line to make a, their general confession after you, and they're going to be looking at their watch as your 15 minutes tick past. And if you take longer than your allotted 15 minutes, you know what kind of looks you're going to get when you come out of the confessional, right? Moreover, a general confession is not normally the time for, gen for a spiritual direction because you've got good priests who come here who can give you the spiritual direction that you need. A general confession is simply your opportunity to, to regurgitate those past sins. You get your, your penance and you get out. It's that simple.
So we've seen these two points, how to make a good confession and how you can easily make a general confession of your entire life. We can end off with the words that Jesus spoke to St. Margaret of Cortona. As you may know, Margaret started her life, like Mary Magdalene, a big sinner. And one day she had this incredible conversion experience, and she immediately ran to the priest and made a general confession of all the sins, of all the scandals that she had given. And afterwards, Jesus appeared to her, and he said, Margaret, by the power of this general confession, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. I'd like to thank you all very much for being here this evening. I'm sure some of you are coming from a distance, and I know it can be a sacrifice to be able to give up a Friday and also a Saturday as well to come to a parish mission, but God is always so generous with us, and you know, he's never outdone in generosity. Anything that, any sacrifices that you make to coming to attend the parish mission, God will reward you and your families, especially with the graces to make good general confessions and also good resolutions for the future. We'll be talking about resolutions last thing tomorrow afternoon. Now, I would like to, uh, bef before the last blessing and the last hymn, I'd like to encourage you again, bring flowers to Our Lady. We'll have a story on Sunday morning at Mass about Our Lady and flowers also, in fact, just to encourage you to bring some flowers, just a little bouquet tomorrow or Sunday morning. And also, if you'd like to kneel down, let's say some prayers for the Pope so that we can get the plenary